let's go through this. We're going to look today at tougher sentences, both legislatively introduced, but also through the courts. Okay, so they're the two aspects. So the Crimes and Other Legislation Amendment, which is the same law we looked at last time that introduced lockouts, also saw a new offence for one-punch assaults introduced with a maximum 20-year sentence. This covered where a person unlawfully assaults another who dies as a direct or indirect result of the assault. Now, you don't have to die. It can just be an assault. But if someone dies, that's what introduced the eight-year minimum sentence. So where the offender was intoxicated in public by alcohol or drugs, a mandatory minimum sentence of eight years and a maximum sentence of 25 years applies. So a minimum of eight years, a maximum of 25. 25 being manslaughter. So the maximum for manslaughter. You have to be intoxicated and be in a public area. Let's look at the definitions of those two. Number one, intoxicated means a person's speech, balance, coordination, or behavior is noticeably affected as the result of taking alcohol or drugs. In addition, a person will be deemed intoxicated if he or she returns a blood alcohol reading of 0.15 or higher within six hours of the offense. Now, if you're 0.05 or higher, you can't drive. Your 0.15, that means you've drunk three times as much alcohol that would ban you from driving legally. And if they do a breathalyzer test on you and find that you have a blood alcohol reading of 0.15, instantly you're deemed to be intoxicated. But otherwise, there is an element of judgment. Now, that element of judgment can be um, determined by the courts. The courts may decide that, you know, they didn't have enough. The 0.15 is very difficult to achieve because by the time the test is done on you, the breathalyzer test, you may be below the 0.15. Okay, so the intoxicated bit can be difficult to implement. And as far as I know, it actually hasn't been imposed yet. Number two, public. Public doesn't just mean out on the street. Public applies to anywhere open to the public and areas in their vicinity. And it specifically lists licensed venues, restricted premises such as brothels, and bikey headquarters. Those are specifically listed as public places. So bikey headquarters, even if it's not open to the public, they're considered public areas. Reckless wounding, reckless grievous bodily harm, and assaulting a police officer will also see a minimum sentence between three and five years, depending on the offence. But if someone dies, you will go to prison for at least eight years. And that means that's the non-parole period. So Kieran Loveridge was sentenced to four years without parole, oh sorry, with parole, um, six years without parole, he would have done a minimum of eight years and then maybe have been released out on parole after that. All right. We also want to look at the court cases. The appeal of the Loveridge case, number one, and also the um, Daniel Christie case uh, against Sean McNeil. So following the appeal to the Criminal Court of Appeal uh, by the Department of Public Prosecution, Loveridge was sentenced to 10 years and six months in prison on the 4th of July 2014, in R. Loveridge 2014. So we see it's the 2014 case. It's been increased from six years to ten and a half years on appeal. The 4 July Sydney Morning Herald article, Kieran Loveridge sentenced for the killing of Thomas Kelly, doubled on appeal uh, by Paul Bibby, said, some have read the judgment as an attempt by the court to send as clear a message as possible about the issue of alcohol fueled violence within the confines of the new laws, Given the limitations of the new mandatory sentencing laws, such as the need to prove intoxication through a breath test or urine test, it may in fact have greater practical impact. Remember, you need to prove that someone is intoxicated. It's very hard to practically prove someone is intoxicated. So maybe the tough judgment here, the, the message it gave out, the high profile nature of that message could be more effective. We're going to see that we come back to this idea. The next year you had the McNeil case. It saw Sean McNeil sentenced to 10 years in prison. The case also cited the Loveridge case as a precedent. So both of them are doing 10 and 10 and a half years in prison now for the manslaughter of Thomas Kelly and Daniel Christie. Let's look at the effectiveness of those tougher sentences and court cases. And in particular, which one has been seen to be more effective? Um, on the 4th of July in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, Nicholas Cowdery wrote, lessons from the Kieran Loveridge sentence. He's a former director of public prosecutions. So he was a former person who would take people like Kieran Loveridge and Daniel Christie, or, or, or um, Sean McNeil, to court, rather. He argued that the appeals process was sufficient for justice to be done and that no additional legislation was necessary. I'm going to repeat that. The appeals process was sufficient for justice to be done. No additional legislation was necessary. Now, that's his opinion, but he's an eminent individual, so you want to take his opinion 
on this as a piece of evidence. He said, Loveridge and those of similar mind and conduct have learned that if you do this and commit manslaughter by an unlawful and dangerous act in the most serious circumstances, you will receive a heavy prison sentence. It is hoped that the additional deterrent effect sought by the appeal, um, sought by the appeal judges will be effective. But offences of this kind are unlikely to be committed by people who stop and weigh the consequences before acting. So he's arguing that Kieran Loveridge, before he went and punched Thomas Kelly thought, before I punch him, will punching him result in me going to prison for ten and a half years? Chances were he wasn't thinking through his choices. So he's arguing that does sending him to prison for six years or ten years make that much of a difference? Was those extra four years really what prevented him from doing it? Because it seemed like he did it anyway. He knew that there was a good chance he was going to prison and he still did it. So he's arguing that these tougher sentences don't actually uh, deter people. It's the likelihood, the enforceability that would. Again, that's his view. He adds, the media may have learned that it can be best to allow the normal processes to take their course, but we can probably expect media shock campaigns to continue. It's the nature of the beast. You, you're likely to see headlines saying, um, you know, violence in King's Cross, government needs to do something about it. That's the nature of the media. But, he says, the politicians have no excuses. They have learned that the system works. When an anomalous case comes along in the flow of a vast number of cases, the system will deal with it too, but it may need more than one go. The courts gave Kieran Loveridge six years at first. He says that was a mistake. The appeals process brought it back to ten years where it should have been. The system got it right, in other words. They should let it operate. There is absolutely no need to rush to legislate some supposed band-aid solution much less to contemplate a manifest evil of the nature of mandatory minimum sentencing. So someone is drunk, punches someone else, they die, you must go to prison for eight years. He doesn't like that, that idea. He disagrees with it. Someone else who disagrees with it is this man, Greg Smith, the Attorney General at the time. He wrote, debate needed to consider ramifications of mandatory sentencing. Importantly, he wrote this in November, before the government introduced mandatory sentencing. He said, around the world, after mandatory sentencing, there are as many victims as before. There is as much drug trafficking or gun possession. The additional costs of running and building prisons would mean that either higher state taxes or less money for schools and hospitals. And it does not consider the circumstances of an offence. So he's giving three reasons here why he opposes mandatory minimum sentencing. He says it doesn't reduce crimes, it increases costs, and it doesn't allow discretion for judges. He also adds, it does not consider the circumstances of an offence. It is therefore frequently imposing sentences on minor offenders which are out of step with their crimes. Research shows when the public is informed of all the circumstances, they reduce their views about the perceived leniency of sentences. Let me talk about this last point for a brief moment. There was a case, an experiment done a while ago, where people were told, um, these are the cases of this particular crime. What would be the appropriate sentence you would give them? So members of the public. And they said, we would give them this amount of time in prison. And then they compared that to the amount of time that judges imposed. And they actually found that members of the public were a lot more lenient on the, the offenders than the magistrates were, than the judges were. And so, in fact, the judges were being harsher on these criminals than members of the public who were well-informed. Now, that goes against what you normally hear in the headlines, where people say, oh, these criminals, they're getting off easy because the magistrates, they live off in some leafy eastern suburbs mansion where they never see crime at all. And so they're imposing these easy sentences on these criminals because they're, they're compassionate and they're bleeding heart progressives. Okay? Experiments would actually indicate otherwise, that when people are educated about a particular situation, they understand why that particular sentence was provided. He says, it is clear that in many cases, sentences for crimes considered abhorrent social ill, such as child sexual abuse, drunken violence, or gun offences, are out of step with community expectations. Okay, this is where he starts to really make his point. Politicians need to pay attention to community sentiment. For years, they have urged judges and magistrates to consider the community attitudes in sentencing. If the public continues to consider sentences out of step with community expectations, our judicial officers should take note or accept the parliament acting for them. In other words, Smith called for judges to increase their sentences for certain crimes if they want to avoid having minimum sentencing imposed on them. He said that 
And then six months later, Kieran Loveridge's sentence is increased from six to ten and a half years. So in other words, what he said, what he asked for, did happen. He said, if judges do not give adequate sentences, they're going to get mandatory minimum sentencing imposed. As it were, judges did listen and they did impose that, but it happened after the minimum sentencing laws were introduced and by then it was too late. 